as much as COVID has dominated uh, our lives over the past year, we have had to deal with ongoing other problems, and certainly cancer is one of them, particularly lung cancer. As we said, it's the number one cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States, and there are more deaths from lung cancer than breast, colon, and prostate combined. Um, and uh, it's pretty common, mostly among smokers, but also in non-smokers. And the risk is about one in 15 for men, which is really pretty frequent uh, among smokers and non-smokers. And as I said, it's much higher in the smoking population. Just to give it some scope, it's a couple of million cases in uh, 2018 uh, and 1.8 million deaths worldwide. So it's a pretty big problem. Uh, and up to 150 or 160,000 uh, in the United States. The trouble with lung cancer is it's usually caught at a late stage. Um, and um, the survival with it is terrible the later the stage is. I'll talk more about staging uh, later in the talk, but you can see from this slide that um, the early stage, stage one compared to stage four, uh, shows a much worse survival uh, such that uh, the survival is really quite poor in advanced stage disease. So I'm going to talk a lot about risk and the uh, main things to worry about it in a way of protecting yourself from lung cancer, which is avoiding the risks as much as you can. So the top three risks are smoking, smoking, and smoking. It's really the major factor. Uh, we'll talk about non-smoking risks as well. 90% of lung cancers are from smokers. Uh, and it's not a new concept. It's been around for a long, long time. It always strikes me as interesting that the Surgeon General report that was published in 1964 finally said it's a bad idea, even though people have been smoking for thousands of years and government giving cigarettes out to GIs in a gesture of goodwill. Uh, and so it took a long time to sort of grasp onto the reality of it. 10 to 30 fold risk compared to non-smokers is quite a bit. Um, the risk does correlate with the number of cigarettes smoked per day, and how long you smoke, whether you inhale or not, tar and nicotine content, people who smoked unfiltered cigarettes. And a lot of people will talk about that in clinic when they're asking about their smoking habits. And the reality is, is there are all factors in it, uh, but the bottom line is that any kind of smoking is a bad idea. So what about quitting smoking? You can reduce your risk for lung cancer within five years of, of quitting completely. Not one or two cigarettes a day, but quitting completely. And uh, if you quit for 15 years, it's an 80 to 90% risk reduction. The one thing that people often say is that, well, I have the same risk as a non-smoker, and the reality is, is that you'll never get back to the non-smoker's risk factors, um, but you can make an, a substantial uh, impact uh, if you are able to quit. A lot of people ask me, well, what if I cut back? And of course, that's always a good idea. If you're a heavy smoker, more than 15 per day, uh, and you cut it by at least 50%, it's about a 30% drop risk reduction still a big problem. You're still at risk for lung cancer, but it's something rather than nothing. Another question that comes up a lot is when people are diagnosed with lung cancer. They're getting treated for it. Quitting smoking, as we all know, can be quite challenging for a lot of people. And even when they're diagnosed with lung cancer, it's a hard thing to give up. But we do know that if you continue to smoke while you're being treated, it increases the mortality or the chance that you'll die. It also increases the chance of developing yet another cancer uh, which is uncommon, but it certainly does happen. Um, that can be tricky, too, as people are, are diagnosed at a late stage, perhaps, and may have a very limited survival. And uh, for some of those people, stopping smoking is just not an option. And it's hard to tell people who may be looking at a six-month survival that they need to quit smoking. So let's move on to some other types of smoking, like secondhand smoke. People ask about this daily. And they talk about, you know, what about if it's just a, you know, a cigarette that's sitting in an ashtray somewhere versus you know, my parent is smoking in the car and exhaling smoke right on me. And these are different types of secondhand smoke, but either one of them raises the risk uh, if you get exposed. 
it's certainly a far less intense exposure than somebody who's primarily smoking, um, but people who have secondhand smoke often have a longer duration of exposure. There was a time when people thought it was controversial, um, it may have come from the tobacco industry, um, but multiple different agencies such as the Surgeon General and these other agencies here looked into this and show very significantly that secondhand smoke is definitely a risk factor for lung cancer. These are just some other statistics that go along with it. Uh, 1.3 times more likely overall and 1.2 times as likely if your spouse smokes or in a workplace. Those things will probably change as workplace smoking is far less common. One thing that people often don't think about is the risk of lung cancer in their children. And it has to do with their exposure, which is measured in something called smoker years. It's the number of years of exposure to, uh, times the number of smokers in the household. So if it was 10 years and two smokers, it's 20 smoker years. Um, but it, that kind of exposure doubles the risk in, in children. For reasons that aren't really uh, terribly clear, that type of secondhand smoke exposure is more associated with small cell carcinoma, which is a particularly aggressive form. I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. And it certainly is influenced by genetics. The next type of smoking I think that's important to talk about is cigars and pipes. Uh, a lot of people think that their risk is lower with cigars and pipes, and it's possible. But if you're a heavy cigar smoker or a heavy pipe smoker, you're certainly at risk for lung cancer. In the one study of about 1,500 people, it was really twice the relative risk if it was more than five cigars per day. And a second study showed even a 5.1 relative risk of cancer and death in a much larger study. So the risk is clearly there with cigar smoking. The same is true with pipe smoking. And these are both really associated with intensity and, uh, and duration and, and frequency. So if somebody smokes a cigar once or twice a year at their bachelor party, they're probably not going to be in trouble with lung cancer. E-cigarettes is a complicated issue. There's no clear risk, but it's largely unknown. I don't know if this is factual or not, but at least from a, a, a perspective of, of, of thinking about e-cigarettes is that humans have been smoking tobacco for thousands of years. E-cigarettes have been around a relatively short time. There's very little data to look at these kinds of risks. My suspicion is that they're certainly uh, risky. Uh, there's reasons to worry about that because of the nicotine and other carcinogens, even though they're at a much lower concentration. The bottom line is we don't really know, so it certainly is a risk. And there's other concerns of using electronic cigarettes, like nicotine dependence or even serious lung injury, which was uh, quite popular a year or so ago when uh, a lot of people were developing lung injury uh, or popcorn lung, so that there are lots of reasons why electronic cigarettes are a bad idea as well, not to mention the potential risk for lung cancer. All right, so that's really the smokers that are in the, the biggest category uh, of people who are at risk to develop lung cancer. And I want to talk now about some other issues of non-smokers who are at risk, and that's things like radon, recreational drugs, Indoor cooking and heating, which is less common in Colorado, but certainly worldwide is a big issue. Air pollution is another issue that comes up. There's a number of lung diseases that are associated with an increased risk for lung cancer, uh, which I'll talk about. Occupational exposures and diet frequently come up as well, and we'll cover those. Okay, so let's talk about radon. It's one of the leading causes of lung cancer in non-smokers, and the problem is it's odorless gas decay of uranium uh, and, and radium, which is in the soil, um, and uh, it can leak up into people's homes, uh, and uh, there's a, an action level, a measurement uh, that comes from the EPA that says that you need to do something to mitigate it, and certainly for people buying homes in Colorado, it's quite common to discuss uh, if there is uh, uh, radon mitigation before you buy the home. And it's pretty prevalent in Colorado. 50% of the homes are higher than the EPA action level. One thing people wonder about is if it's this type of floor or that type of floor, and it doesn't really matter. It can be high in all homes. Uh, and if you're a smoker and you get radon, it's a synergistic risk for lung cancer in that group. 
testing is done uh, on an average of hourly reports. You, you put a, a measurement device in the basement or the lowest point of the home, uh, and if you have a, a, a rate that's higher than the EPA action level, you need to do something about it. Um, it pictured here is a typical uh, rate on a mitigation system that can cost around about $1,000. It can vary by home depending on whether there's a basement or a crawl space or what have you, but it's something that uh, is um, a way to protect yourself from lung cancer, is uh, mitigate radon. So recreational drugs are a, a bit of a quandary as well because there's not as much uh, data for that as there is for tobacco smoke, but a lot of people want to know, particularly as marijuana, for example, is getting legalized for recreational use in, in many states, not the least of which is Colorado. There's small studies that suggest it's possible that marijuana smoking is linked to lung cancer, but it's not really clear, and they weren't great studies either. They didn't really correct for tobacco intake as well, and so if somebody's a tobacco smoker and a marijuana smoker, it's hard to know which is causing the problem, particularly since we know tobacco smoke is a major risk factor. Um, what we do know is that some of the cells in the lungs uh, do uh, change uh, to sort of precancerous cells, and that may be a risk factor for that. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're lung cancer, it just says they're starting to make changes that indicate they might. So the magnitude of risk is really not defined. The same is true for smoking cocaine. Uh, we don't see that so much anymore. And of course, for cocaine, there are lots of other issues to worry about, like crack lung, people who smoke crack and get severe lung injury, um, and uh, early coronary artery disease from using cocaine. So there's lots of problems with that drug, uh, and lung cancer might be one of them. Uh, opium is another problem. Uh, certainly worldwide, a lot of people smoke opium, and there's uh, a definite increased risk uh, when smoked. It's dose-dependent, as most of the other things are. Um, and this is different than people who are using morphine or heroin uh, or fentanyl. So indoor cooking and heating, we're talking about uh, using wood or coal uh, in the home for these purposes. Certainly there's a lot of wood stoves uh, that people use both for heat and cooking here in Colorado uh, as well as worldwide. Um, the wood smoke is a little less clear, but it's possible it is. Um, we know that with certain types of uh, coal used in this fashion, there's about a 20% increase. So it's certainly something to be uh, thoughtful about, and uh, ventilation, of course, would be a major issue there. Okay, so air pollution. People worry about this all the time. In fact, in clinic, it's a pretty common thing that says, well, I lived in you know, inner city X, and I was breathing in all this pollution all day long, and I'm sure my lung cancer has nothing to do with my two packs a day smoking. And the reality is, is that air pollution certainly does contribute to these problems as it does to many other things, such as asthma. But the contribution's really quite tiny compared to smokers. There was one large European study that said there was clearly a risk and it seemed to be increased the closer you were to uh, high traffic areas. Uh, diesel exhaust in particular uh, is proportional to the extent of exposure, kind of a recurring theme there. I guess my point about air pollution is to say, yeah, it's something to consider uh, for sure, but probably a small factor compared to smoking tobacco. So there's other things that people worry about, such as radiation therapy. We use radiation therapy for breast cancer and Hodgkin's disease, uh, among others. And there was a time when it was fairly crude and broad and there was a bigger risk there. The radiation exposure that people get for those diseases is carefully monitored specifically for this purpose, as well as other issues like radiation pneumonitis, which is kind of an inflammation of the lungs uh, related to that. So we don't see it so much anymore. There's a variety of lung diseases that are highly associated with it, independent of the smoking risk. COPD, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is quite common uh, and is primarily a disease of smokers as well. There's a few cases you can get COPD from without smoking, but it's quite rare. But in studies looking specifically at COPD, we believe it's an independent risk factor, regardless of your smoking status. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF, uh, is a devastating disease of scarring in the lungs. It tends to happen in older people 
Um, its cause is largely unknown, uh, but it's a slow, progressive, relentless lung disease that often causes trouble with oxygen, uh, and there's very little treatment for it, uh, but by itself is another risk factor to develop lung cancer. Tuberculosis, or TB, is another one that is associated with lung cancer, as is certain types of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Alpha-1 is a pretty rare disease uh, that can also be quite devastating. It is genetic, uh, and uh, you can be tested for it if it's in your family. And if you have these specific alleles, the S or Z allele I'm pointing out here, are specific types of alpha-1 that can be tested for. Asbestosis is another thing I'll talk about in some more detail. Genetics is a big issue. People want to know about, you know, does it run in my family and should I be worried about that? And the answer to that question is absolutely. It's primarily in first degree relatives, parents, brothers, sisters, less so if it's an uncle or a grandparent or something like that. Uh, I don't think that it's known whether that's a, a negative risk factor, but the primary risk if it's in a first degree relative is definitely a risk in and of itself. Race or ethnicity has been studied a little bit and it's really not terribly clear if it's higher um, in certain groups rather than others. And in fact, one study said it may be lower in the Hispanic population. I'm not so sure that that's uh, true or clear, uh, but there is some, some concern for that. So let's talk a little bit about asbestosis. Asbestosis is a disease, it's a scarring or interstitial fibrosis. It's associated with asbestos exposure. And when I talk about asbestos exposure, I'm talking about people who work with asbestos. Plumbers, pipe fitters, people working directly with insulation, uh, or they're involved in um, demolition where the fibers of asbestos are being aerosolized and they're not wearing a mask. People fear asbestos because it can be a devastating disease in and of itself. Uh, but when there's asbestos tiles, say, in a school or a building that you're living in and there's no destruction going on, it's not a risk really uh, at all for asbestosis and subsequently lung cancer. The one cancer, though, that people worry about in the lungs associated with asbestos, which is almost always associated with that, is something called mesothelioma. Gets a lot of airplay on television. I'm convinced I need to call a lawyer every time I turn a television on, which is uncommon. But in any case, mesothelioma is a cancer of the pleura. The pleura is sort of the lining of the lung, helps the lung to move smoothly without friction. Uh, and uh, it is clearly associated with asbestos, this cancer of the pleura uh, called mesothelioma. It's more common in older people, uh, men more than women, and it's overall a very rare cause of cancer. There's an interesting phenomenon both for asbestosis as well as mesothelioma in that there's a long latency period, a long time from the time of exposure to the time that you see disease. 20 to 30 years later, if it's a significant exposure, uh, and significant being 15 to 20 years. So it's a lot of exposure, it shows up a long time later, um, and uh, the first worry is asbestosis, and if you have asbestosis, you certainly worry about lung cancer. And not only mesothelioma, that's the one we worry about most frequently, but there are other types of lung cancer that can be associated with asbestosis as well. All right, so let's talk about the diet a little bit. It's another common question that people have for just about everything. Um, and uh, the idea is that diet is not likely a factor. Whether you're a vegetarian or a vegan, it doesn't change your lung cancer risk. Um, there were some studies that said you may lower your lung cancer risk, which is far different than causing lung cancer, if you have a diet high in fruits and vegetables. That's always a good idea anyway for your general health. Uh, but there's conflicting studies if it actually does reduce the risk. Probably the most important thing to think about diet is that there's really nothing, including sugars or sugary drinks, that really increase your risk for lung cancer specifically. And people use antioxidants for a variety of reasons, but it's important to know that that doesn't lower your lung cancer risk. There may be other properties of antioxidants that are favorable, um, but it doesn't lower your lung cancer risk, and that uh, comes from the American Lung Association, so I think it's pretty well backed up. 
There's a couple other supplements that people have talked about a little bit, B6 and B12. There are some studies that said, hey, these things actually might increase your risk in men, but it's very limited data, and it seems that the only risk that people found had to do with specific supplements of B6 and B12, but not if those were included in multivitamins. So it's a little bit unclear whether that's really a risk or not. Perhaps more importantly is beta carotene, which is promoted as a way to prevent lung cancer. And in fact, some of the trials looking into beta carotene showed that it actually increased the risk, particularly smokers, but again, that's a confounding variable there. So I'm just gonna talk quickly about chemo prevention. What I mean is things that you could take that, to help prevent lung cancer. And the reality is there's no convincing evidence that any approach other than quitting smoking will decrease the risk of lung cancer. Everything else is investigational. We don't know whether that's actually gonna do that or not. Aspirin and vitamin E were looked at specifically and showed that there is a trend uh, in reducing the incidence of lung cancer, um, but it's not really clear if that's true. Other things such as inhaled steroids showed some possible decreased risk in some small studies and a variety of other drugs have indicated they may be a lower risk, but it's really unclear whether they have a benefit or not. So the main message on the chemo prevention side of things is that uh, there really isn't anything that uh, can decrease that risk other than don't smoke or quit. All right. So those are really sort of the big risks for uh, lung cancer. One thing that didn't make it into the slide set I wanted to comment on is um, chest x-rays and CT scans. People worry about that in terms of the radiation exposure and is it a risk for lung cancer. Um, and it's not terribly clear, but we know that if the radiation exposure is high enough, it is a risk for lung cancer. But a chest x-ray is the equivalent to being outside uh, for about a day uh, in the sun. So it's like background radiation. A CT scan is a lot more, it's about 10 times that amount. But four or five CT scans in the course of a year is not usually too much, it keeps you well below the thresholds for that, and it's rare that we need that many CT scans. So I guess my point about diagnostic films and the radiation from those is uh, the healthcare systems are very much in tune with that, they try to keep your exposure low, they monitor it very closely, as well as the people working in healthcare. All right, so now we're gonna talk about screening. And this is probably the best thing uh, that has come around. Not that many years ago, there was no screening for lung cancer, despite it being such a major killer. And there were a lot of studies looking at ways to screen for lung cancer. Should we do chest x-rays on everybody? Should we do CT scans on everybody? Uh, should we try some blood work? And nothing really was panning out until eventually people kind of figured out that said, hey, well, if we get CT scans on the right people, we can actually prevent disease. And so screening for lung cancer, the why question is the same as it is for breast or colon or whatever. We screen for it because it saves lives. It makes a big difference. It's widely accepted and recommended by many, many people, many organizations, uh, and eventually uh, Medicare and subsequently the rest of the insurance industry bought into that idea and said, hey, this is a good idea. It doesn't take a lot either if you think about the relative number it needs to screen to prevent one cancer-related re death. In lung cancer, that's about 300 people. In breast cancer, it's 1,500 people. It's not that screening for breast cancer is a bad idea. Of course, it's a great idea, as is for colon cancer. But the number of people needed to screen is far less in, in lung cancer. The one thing about screening that worries people a lot, particularly uh, for people like me who, who see the results of those screening tests, is that it's not without risk. There's about a 10% false positive rate, and uh, that can be quite anxiety provoking for people, which is certainly understandable. Uh, and um, these sort of incidental findings uh, 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 can be quite debilitating just to hear about. On the other hand, they can be sometimes beneficial you may see early interstitial lung disease that somebody was unaware of when you're screening for lung cancer, for example. When you're getting biopsies, which we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, that there are issues associated with that, problems that can be caused just trying to find out, well, what is it? I've got a spot on my lung, what is it from? And then the radiation exposure, which I just talked about, is certainly 
uh, some risk, but we use a low dose screening technique so that the radiation exposure for screening for lung cancer is different than say a CAT scan used for a pulmonary embolism or blood clot in the lungs. The US Preventative Services Task Force uh, is a large national agency and their recommendations are we use low dose CT to screen adults between the ages of 55 and 80 as well as having a 30 pack year smoking history. That means smoking a pack a day for 30 years or two packs a day for 15 years. So it's a fair amount of smoking, but those are the people that qualify. If they've quit, but it's only been less than 15 years, you keep checking. Once you pass the 15 year mark or the age mark, then you stop screening for it because the benefit seems to drop off. This is true for Medicare as well. The only real difference is the age cutoff, uh, which is 77. Most physicians I know uh, will go to 80 depending on what's happening with the patient, but they're about the same. Okay, so if we screen for it and we find it, how do we go about that? Well, the first thing people wanna know about is what are the symptoms of lung cancer? And these symptoms I'm listing here are the more common ones, but it's important to know that symptoms are just a clue. And that doesn't mean that you have lung cancer. Even if you cough up blood, it's not the meaning that for sure it's lung cancer, but it does raise my suspicion. Cough in general is probably the most common symptom for people with lung cancer, but it's a really rare cause. Lung cancer is a very rare cause in people who have chronic cough. This worries people a ton. I see people for a cough every day. Uh, and there's usually some benign reason for it. Asthma or sinus disease or reflux disease are the much more common reasons. And while lung cancer, of course, can cause cough, it usually isn't the case. Coughing up blood scares people, and as it would expect it to do. But infections can do that as well. Uh, even just having a very severe cough can cause you to cough up some blood. Uh, but certainly amongst people who do have lung cancer, coughing up blood comes up quite often. Shortness of breath and chest pain, again, are very vague symptoms, and there's a million different causes of those problems, uh, but certainly can be part of the lung cancer story. Unintentional weight loss uh, and a poor appetite are the same thing. They, they do uh, make me suspect that there may be a malignancy. It doesn't mean it's lung cancer alone. Um, people who are going on a, a diet and exercise program and are intentionally losing weight is a whole other category and it usually does not indicate that. There's other symptoms as well, but these are sort of the more common ones. So when we look for them, if somebody comes with symptoms, it's usually a chest x-ray or a CAT scan uh, of the chest. And that's useful because not only does it look at the lungs, but it also looks at some of the other structures just beneath the lungs, which is very important in staging. There's also something called a PET scan, which is a way to look for hypermetabolic cells. Cancer cells are hypermetabolic. They use up your body's normal glucose at a much faster rate than your normal cells. And by using a PET scan, we can find those cells easier. It's an important step for staging, looking for the extent of disease, um, but is insufficient by itself. And it also has false positives, like infection or inflammation, granulomas, which are old scars, can light up on a PET scan. False negatives happen as well. Lesions that are too small, uh, or even some lung cancers that are very slow growing, like some adenocarcinomas, won't get picked up on a PET scan because they're not that hypermetabolic. So here's a chest x-ray example on, um, on, on the, I guess it's your right, uh, the dark areas are the, are the lungs and the lighter areas are the normal tissues. This image points out the heart. You can see the ribs there as well. And on the film next to it, you can see a large darkened area uh, and that's a mass in the lung. That can be confusing in that particular area because sometimes it's a blood vessel. But you can see between these two films, clearly there's something there. The chest x-ray is also just a clue and it usually leads to a CT scan and or a PET scan. One of the things that crosses my mind when I talk about CT scans, for those who don't know about it, is that they worry uh, that it's gonna be like an MRI. And I get the question every day, 
is that the tunnel? And people get very claustrophobic about that and they're very worried about it. And while the MRI is an extremely useful diagnostic tool, it's far different than a CAT scan or CT scan. It's a big donut, as you can see pictured here. You put your hands up over your head and you hold your breath for 10 seconds, in and out. It's very quick. Um, so it's easy to get that. The PET scan is quite similar. This is a typical CAT scan image. Again, the dark areas around the sides there are the normal lung, the trachea, or your windpipe is right in the middle, and that's the very black thing. Over on the side where the line is pointing, that's a mass that's in there, and it shouldn't be there. The other white areas in here are blood vessels, and so those are normal. But clearly there's a mass there that looks to be probably in the left lower lobe. Here's an example of a PET scan image. This is a mass that's in the right upper lobe, and the very bright area is what we would call pet avid. It's, it's lighting up a lot more than the other tissues, and that says this is very hypermetabolic. It doesn't clinch the diagnosis of cancer, though the more metabolic it is, or the brighter it is on that image, makes it more suspicious for a cancer. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about staging because it's an important part uh, in the discovery of lung cancer. And all staging really means is the extent of disease. Does it invade another tissue, such as the edge of the heart? Does it invade the chest wall? Is it a large tumor or a small tumor? And these are all very important to figure out how extensive is the disease. This is a busy slide that just gives an example of the lymph nodes, which are all over uh, the lung and all over the body. I tend to think of the lymphatic system as a, a kind of drainage system outside the blood vessels, outside the arteries and the veins. And when those lymphatic vessels come to an intersection, uh, we call that a lymph node. And there are very specialized cells there that are part of your immune system. And they're all over your body. And in the lung, they're all over the airways and these spots. And it's important to know if there's cancer in those lymph nodes. This slide is probably too small to see, but it gives you a sense of the complexity of staging lung cancers. It's called the TNM system. We use it for many other cancers as well. Basically, we want to know about the tumor and its characteristics. How big is it? Uh, is there more than one? Is it adjacent to some other structure? Is there cancer in the lymph nodes? And is there evidence of metastases? A metastases just means cancer that spread to some other part of the body, like the adrenal gland, or the liver, or the brain. Because once it's spread that far, it's a worse prognosis and much more complicated to treat. So when we find these things, there's a variety of ways to get tissue. And that's really the most important aspect. One of the most common ones is what we call CT-guided needle biopsy. It's using a CT scan to identify exactly where the tumor is and sticking a needle in from the outside. It doesn't require general anesthesia. It's usually local anesthesia, so you're awake, but you don't feel anything. And it's done by an interventional radiologist who puts you on the table, localizes exactly where it is, and then puts the needle directly in it, as you can see in these images. It's a very low risk procedure. It's worse when people have emphysema because you, sometimes if you have to go through enough lung, you can pop a hole in the lung, the lung collapses. It's called a pneumothorax. Most of the time a pneumothorax is easily treatable, but nobody really wants you to have those. Sometimes the pneumothorax is quite small and you can just observe it. Worser scenarios is that you have to put a chest tube in to drain the air out. But that's uncommon with this procedure. The other one, uh, diagnostic procedure to use is a bronchoscopy. Um, a bronchoscopy is a procedure that pulmonologists, like me and many others, perform for lots of reasons, one of which is to make a diagnosis of lung cancer. What I tell people very frequently is it's a, similar to a colonoscopy, except of course I'm going in the other end. Uh, so it's a long flexible scope as you can see in this diagram and it's typically used for larger lesions, uh, or if you can see an airway that's going directly to one of these tumors. Um, and uh, it does require fluoroscopy, which is kind of a real-time chest x-ray, so we can see where we're going. Um, when the bronchoscope goes in, as you can see by the diagram here, 
it really doesn't get terribly far out into the edge of the lungs. So many times when we're doing biopsies, we have to do our best to localize where we think it is. We use the fluoroscopy to give us a good idea. Uh, and you can take those biopsies uh, and, and make your diagnosis. This is just another schematic that gives you an idea of what it's like while we're doing these procedures. Some people will go through the nose. I prefer to go through the mouth. People are more comfortable that way. Do you get conscious sedation? You don't really care what's happening. We don't want you to have to cough or be uncomfortable, but you're breathing on your own. And the uh, view is uh, um, displayed on a screen so we can see inside the lungs and see what's happening. And this is a view of that going on. The CT scan image uh, shows a, a nodule um, uh, in, the, in the left lung, and this is a bronchoscopic view of what that nodule looks like. So if I was doing this bronchoscopy and I saw that, I would say this is most likely gonna be a cancer, and I would try to get biopsies from that. Another procedure that's not that new anymore, but relatively new, is called endobronchial ultrasound. And this is a special bronchoscope that uh, uses an ultrasound image to see on the outside uh, of the airway. Recall earlier I showed a slide of all the lymph nodes that are scattered all around the lungs. Uh, and those, of course, we can't see from the inside. By using this EBUS uh, probe, I can use an ultrasound image so that I can see the lymph node outside the airways and then stick a needle into that and make a diagnosis that way. Not only is it good to make the diagnosis, but it helps with staging and it's become more or less the standard of care for staging uh, and uh, can be quite, quite a useful tool uh, for those purposes. In fact, I just did one a few hours ago. Another procedure that's commonly used, uh, less so these days because of the advent of EBUS, is mediastinoscopy. Sometimes the EBUS doesn't work out just right or it's non-diagnostic. And so either a thoracic surgeon and sometimes a general surgeon will do this mediastinoscopy where a small incision is made uh, just above the sternum and a scope is put in there and they'll sample the lymph nodes that way. So those are the ways that we get at it. Those are the biopsy types. There's a variety of lung cancer types um, most of the time, it's what we call a non-small cell. The distinction between small cell lung cancer and non-small cell is important because small cell lung cancer is a very aggressive form of cancer, uh, and it reacts differently than most of the other ones, and so that's why that distinction is made. There's a variety of subtypes in non-small cell, such as adenocarcinoma, which again has even more subtypes that can affect the treatment choices. Squamous cell carcinoma is another non-small cell carcinoma, and there's a small number of other types as well, sarcoma, for example. I'm just going to briefly talk about treatment here. I think it's beyond the scope of today's talk, but the main things are surgery, chemo, and radiation. And the message I want to get is that if you can get surgery, then that's the best uh, option that you can have. The outcomes are better, the prognosis is better, it's usually reserved for earlier stage disease. But the, the statement of if you can get can, uh, surgery for it is an important one because some people may have early stage disease, but they have so many other diseases going on that the risk of cutting it out is too high. Remember earlier I said that COPD is an independent risk factor for lung cancer, and that often leads to destruction of lung tissue. And if your COPD is bad enough and your lung function is so poor, sometimes we wouldn't be doing you any favors by cutting it out, so you would not be a surgical candidate. But any time we make the diagnosis of lung cancer, we try very hard to prove that it's an early stage disease and get you to surgery uh, if you're a, a candidate. Chemotherapy is just drug therapy, and this is a very complex field. Uh, and the, more recently, there's been immunotherapy, which is a slightly different version of drug therapy designed for lung cancer and can be very specific to certain subtypes of, for example, adenocarcinoma. Radiation is also used uh, in a variety of ways, sometimes a cyber knife, for example, somebody who can't go to surgery, then we use a cyber knife, which is a very precise way to kind of kill off just the cancer cells. Uh, 
External beam is the classic sort of radiation therapy, and there's even brachytherapy where we take little beads and put them inside the lungs and deliver the radiation that way. Finally, I would just say that many people who have more advanced disease will get some combination of all these treatment strategies. So that's it. I'm ready for questions. Very much. That was really informational and appreciate your time in educating all of us about uh, lung disease and smoking, smoking, smoking. Let's all stop, you know, so that uh, we can prevent that. Um, I'll just start right in here, but want to remind our uh, audience that you can uh, ask questions in the chat box and we will try to get to as many as we can. Um, and then we'll go from there. So we'll start with a fairly specific one. Uh, it said that they are 67 years old. Uh, their mother passed away at 69 years old from lung cancer. They don't smoke, but they are 67. Um, should they get a CT scan or any other precautionary measures? The answer is not to get a CT. You wouldn't qualify for a CT scan in terms of screening purposes. Certainly, uh, having a first-degree relative is a major risk factor for that. Um, but as a non-smoker, and in particular, none of the other uh, non-smoking risks, like the radon, et cetera, that we had talked about, uh, then it is certainly a concern. And if you had alarming symptoms like weight loss and poor appetite and coughing up blood, that might be a useful thing to do but that person specifically would not qualify for screening CT scan. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned it a little bit, but um, is there a difference between cigarette smoke and marijuana smoke? Uh, there is. Cigarette smoke is strongly associated with lung cancer. Marijuana smoking, it's less clear. There's a lot less data about it. It's not terribly clear. We know that uh, it can change the cells in the lungs to a precancerous state, uh, but it's just really not clear whether that causes lung cancer or not. What about secondhand smoke from e-cigarettes? Uh, even more vague, <laughs> because uh, e-cigarettes themselves, we really don't know. Uh, there's no clear evidence that they do cause lung cancer. And so secondhand exposure from an e-cigarette, as far as I know, nobody's ever studied that uh, issue. Okay. We have some new territory, it sounds like. <laughs> Are there any leading edge studies in progress? Absolutely, all the time. Uh, there's constant studies being performed all over the country. Usually these are run through cancer centers, such as the Rocky Mountain Cancer Center that's adjacent to Boulder Community Health. Uh, and the oncologists are usually actively recruiting uh, people to participate in those studies. Most of them, as far as I know, are focused on things such as treatment, um, but there's a ton of research going on uh, all over the world. Okay, just one second here. What about reactions to smoke from forest fires? I'm not aware of any studies that show that forest fires increase your risk for lung cancer. Certainly, uh, uh, wood smoke is a potential, uh, but on a, just from a forest fire where it's uh, an exposure that's short-lived, uh, I doubt that would increase the risk for lung cancer. Uh, by itself. Certainly an irritant and can cause all kinds of other uh, issues, but I don't think specifically a risk for lung cancer. It's a good question. Okay. Um, can you go over again um, early symptoms, mainly because you also mentioned that there could be a 20 to 30 year latency. Uh, I'm sorry if I confuse that. The 20 to 30 year latency story is very specific to asbestosis and mesothelioma. Okay, so thank you. So if you have an occupational exposure to asbestos, that's where the latency comes into play. The other common symptoms, which don't apply necessarily in those cases, are cough, which is the, one of the most common ones, coughing up blood, shortness of breath, chest pain, 
poor appetite and weight loss. Those things are things to think about, but again, I can't stress enough that even if you have all of them, it is not a foregone conclusion that it is cancer. It could be, and it's worth looking into, certainly if you have any of those symptoms. For a cough, for example, I think is a good thing to, 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 to really dwell on just for a second there, since cough is so common. It's the number one reason patients go to doctor offices is for cough. And most of the time, a chest x-ray will be done as a precautionary method. Almost always, the chest x-ray is normal in a, someone who's got a chronic cough. And remember, I had said earlier that less than 2% of cough turns out to be lung cancer. But we do a chest x-ray for people with cough just to be sure. And every now and then, uh, you'll find something that is a, a, the demon there. But usually, cough is something benign. You had mentioned the role of genetics in lung cancer, and um, uh, I think it was called the first degree. Um, we wanted to find out um, what role genetics did play in the probability of getting lung cancer, especially if you do not smoke. Yeah, it's a big factor. Um, that's true not only in lung cancer, but other types of cancers as well. So. Uh, having a family history is a major uh, factor. An example would be for people who say um, get a CAT scan for some other reason, say it's an incidental finding that there's a, a nodule that maybe was three or four millimeters, which is pretty small. Um, but the major questions that I want to know for that person is to say, A, do you smoke or did you ever smoke? And B, do you have a family history of lung cancer? because a family history of lung cancer puts you in a high risk category. Again, doesn't mean that that nodule in that person is lung cancer, but it's a higher risk. So I look uh, with additional CAT scans sooner. So genetics and family history is a big factor, but if you're a non-smoker and don't have any other risk factors for it or any other symptoms, it's only something that you should be aware of and doesn't require any immediate action. So it's not something that um, is suggested when you hit a certain age that you need to start getting tested, such R as happens with uh, colon cancer with a family history? Right. No, there's not. Not, but not in and of itself. If you're a smoker, that's when we start doing the screening. That's when you hit the age that's 55 to 80. Then you start screening for lung cancer in that group, regardless of your family history. But if it's only family history, and that's the only thing, then you don't qualify for screening. And the idea there is uh, not that we uh, don't want you to worry about it, uh, it's just to say that the likelihood of us finding it, if that's the only risk factor, is much lower. Okay. So you mentioned asbestos. Uh, is that a current problem or is it um, just a problem if asbestos was installed before a certain year? Um, any other details you can share with us about that? Yeah, asbestos, um, it's, it is still a current problem, although we're much better at it. There was a time, you know, 40 years ago or whatever, where people were working with asbestos without using a respirator or some type of mask. Uh, and so they were inhaling the asbestos fibers. Or, oddly enough, uh, asbestos workers who would come home and their clothes were covered in asbestos fibers and the spouse would subsequently get exposed. So it's still a current issue, um, but it has nothing really to do with when asbestos was installed. It has more to do with your occupational exposure. It's plumbers, shipyard workers, pipe fitters, people that are involved in the demolition, but even for people who do asbestos mitigation, say a structure has to be demolished and they've got to get the asbestos out, they go to great efforts to keep those fibers from floating around. What if you've only smoked less than five years? Maybe now just smoke occasionally or not at all. You do fall into that 15-year category. Um, or did you just not smoke for very long and you're, you're scot-free? It's hard to be terribly specific, but most of the time when somebody tells me their smoking history and they say, well, you know, I smoked when I was in college for one or two years. It was less than a half a pack a day kind of thing. I don't worry about that too much, particularly if the 15 years has passed. Remember that I said that with complete abstinence. It's, you know, it's, it's a pretty, it's about an 85% reduction in risk. Um, 
So that sort of dabbling once in a while, have a cigarette once a year kind of thing, I don't really think that's a major risk factor. There's no specific study at it. Um, but I would say one thing is that particularly when it comes to lung cancer and lung injury in general, nothing should really go in your lungs other than good clean air. Okay, that's why we live in Colorado. <laughs> um, is the ultrasound to look at lymph nodes outside of the lungs standard practice? And then are the lymph nodes biopsied? Uh, the ultrasound-guided uh, needle aspirate, or the endobronchial ultrasound I mentioned earlier, is the standard of care um, all around the world. Um, and the lymph node is biopsied. There's a variety of ways to get biopsy material. Sometimes we use a forceps when we can see the lung. If you got a chance to see the endobronchial lesion I showed earlier, the forceps are as a tiny little um, uh, uh, device that takes crumb-sized bites out of it. In the lymph nodes, we use a needle that goes through the airway into the lymph node, and then we suck out the cells that way, and we look at those under a slide. So it is biopsy, but through a needle, not from the forceps. Okay. Is cybernite um, radiation becoming standard practice? I would say, uh, I'm not sure I would call it standard practice, but it is certainly a standard tool that we use. Um, what's the best method you know of for quitting smoking? <laughs> uh, that's a challenging subject uh, for many, many people um, because it comes from many things. Um, most of the time, uh, I tell people is it's really the first step to quitting smoking is understanding that it's a cycle of addiction. Uh, and the first step is deciding uh, that you actually want to quit. I say that in the sense of the privacy of your own mind. It doesn't matter what I tell the patients. It doesn't matter what their family or loved ones tell them. It's only when the patient themselves says, I'm going to do this. And you have to convince yourself that you're going to do it. Because if you're doing it for me, it's not likely to work. But if you're doing it for yourself, you got a shot at it. So that's the first step. The next step is to pick a date. And some people say, yeah, I'm going to quit one of these days. It doesn't really work. But if you say, I'm going to quit on my birthday, or New Year's Eve, or the 4th of July, or tomorrow, Pick the date and stick to it. There are other things that people do to help quitting smoking. One of them is nicotine replacement. And by itself has been not terribly effective. I don't recall the percentages off the top of my head at the moment. Uh, but it's pretty low in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 percent. Then for a while, people talked about um, trying to uh, limit the craving to smoke, which is a huge factor. And they used antidepressants like Wellbutrin. And that bumped it up to about 30 or 40 percent. That still means 60 to 70 percent of people are still failing um, with that. Um, and then along came a drug called Chantix, um, which blocks the nicotine receptors in your body. And the idea there is that it, it's part of the craving mechanism. and It makes, tricks your body to think that you've got the nicotine even though you don't. And that raises up that success rate into the 50 percent range. It's a little bit of a tricky drug. Some people don't feel well with it. They have bad dreams or they have problems with psychiatric illness such as depression. Uh, so it can be a tricky drug to use. But those are just things that are meant to be uh, adjuncts, things to help you with it uh, because it really comes down to you've got to decide to do so on your, on your own. The last thing I'd say about quitting smoking is it's such a habitual thing and people can usually recognize when they're smoking. I'm in a bar with a friend and I'm having a drink, that's when I want to smoke. I've just had a meal or whatever the case may be. And if they can identify those triggers and say, hey, that's just my trigger, I'm going to do something else, then they'll be more successful. But it's a very challenging problem. Are Chantix and some of those drugs covered by insurance and prescribed by a doctor? All of them. Yeah. Uh, Chantix is something that I prescribe on a regular basis. Um, so this person was a flight attendant in the days of smoking on planes, and her mother smoked her entire childhood. Is her risk higher for lung cancer? The straight answer is yes. And that person's been exposed to secondhand smoke uh, in a big way, both at, in the home as well as in the workplace. So it's not quite as much as somebody who has smoked primarily primarily 
um, but it fits into that secondhand smoke exposure and there is a 1.2 to 1.3 uh, relative risk increase. It means that yes, your risk is certainly higher. Okay. And for this person, the 86-year-old mother has EGFR mutation in her stage 2B lung cancer. Is this genetic? Boy, that's a very complex question. I would defer <laughs> to the oncologist for that one. That's a very specific type of marker. Uh, I would say that um, the straight answer is I don't really know if that specific genetic mutation is, in fact, uh, uh, um, something that is going to be passed down in families. But that's one of the markers that we look at um, when we're doing the biopsies to find out about very tailored therapy. Okay. How long does it typically take for false positives to be identified? And can there be damage done in other tests or procedures uh, that are given? Um, Those might be two, two I, questions. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not quite sure I got it, but I'll take a stab at it. Well, a false positive might be, say, somebody gets a CT scan for some other reason, and we find a nodule that's incidental. And so we usually do additional CT scans at intervals after that. Typically, we might do it, say, at three months, do another CT scan, uh, particularly if the patient's at high risk. They're already a smoker or have a history of smoking and a family history. And then if nothing changes at three months, we'll check it again at six or maybe a year. And generally, uh, if nothing changes uh, or it goes away after a two-year period, then we can say, okay, okay, that's very likely benign and not cancer. It's not 100%. But that's the length of time it could potentially take. The second question, I th could you repeat? I think it had something to do with biopsy. Uh, can there be damage done in uh, the other test or procedures? Yeah, there can. Uh, for example, both with the CT-guided biopsy and the bronchoscopy, we're taking tissue out of the lung, and if we poke a hole in the lung, the lung will collapse. Air leaks out of the lung, and it doesn't have anywhere to go, so it compresses the lung. Most of the time when that happens, it's a small amount of air, and we don't have to do anything about it. it the air will be reabsorbed, and it'll go away. Every now and then, you have to put a, a chest tube in to evacuate the air. Bleeding and infection are other possibilities anytime we do a procedure, but for all of those complications, we go to great efforts to make sure that they don't happen. Um, I think we only have time here for a couple other questions. The other ones will have to come uh, to you afterwards. Sure. Um, so uh, let's do this one. Which is better, CT scan or x-ray patient with MAC? MAC? MAC, mycobacterium avium complex, which is uh, well off today's topic, but that's a chronic infection uh, and the x-ray uh, is not very useful in that disorder. The CT scan is far better, uh, but the CT scan can only guess if MAC is present. It usually requires some type of sputum sample. What about screening for an 18-year smoker who also has had about 20 plus years of radon that unfortunately were over the EPA limit? That person's clearly at high risk for lung cancer and should get a screening CT scan. Thank you very much. That'll be it for our Q&A session. Okay. So we've come to the end of our time. A recording of tonight's lecture is available at bch.org backslash live stream. You will receive a post-lecture survey by email Please take a minute to fill this out. Again, please visit bch.org for information on the COVID vaccine. Thank you for joining us and have a good night.